Hi, thanks for checking out the Catalyst Church sermons. We hope you enjoy this message and pray that God speaks to you through the words that are preached. Have a great day. Well, let's get the privilege right now of introducing our guest speaker. I was thinking about it yesterday. You know what? Probably will come as no surprise, but I sometimes find it difficult leading a church. I find leading a church challenging uh, in its own right. Just this one place, little old Ipswich leading a church sometimes is difficult. But I think it's why I've got so much respect for uh, Paul and Lynn Gibbs that are with us this morning. Paul uh, decided not to just start one thing, but to start something that would spread all over the world. And now it is in something like six different continents around the world. I imagine that represents hundreds and hundreds of PAYS teams like we have. Uh, They started at, I think it was 92 or 93, uh, around there. So for nearly um, 30 years, (coughs) have just been so faithful and committed to the cause. And I think what grabbed my heart about Um, the ministry of uh, Paul and Lynn is their heart for this thing called discipleship and their their heart for starting something that is not just in one place but moves all around the world which is movement itself and and I think personally I think that's something God is doing around the world at the moment I think he's reminding the church about some of the basics so we've got a great great speaker here this morning I think we should listen up I said to my daughters just yesterday I just checked in, you're going to be in church tomorrow. And they sort of looked at me like as if they'd be somewhere else. But every now and again, you know, they do a double shift and they serve somewhere. And I, <clears throat> and I just said to them, I just want you to hear because we're going to be challenged. It'll be, it'll be a great, great time this morning with Paul. wanted to mention too, Paul is also an author. I think this has been already mentioned, but <clears throat> a number of books are available out in the heart. Um, this is the latest, Shalom, How to Reach Anyone, Anywhere. I haven't read that one, but I hear it's great. I certainly will be grabbing a copy. Uh, Talendum, I've read this one and it's a great book, Paul. It's impacted the life of our church, how to disciple anyone uh, in anything. And I'm pretty sure this is the heart of what Paul will be sharing about uh, later on today. And of course, Haverham, how to study anything with anyone. So you're probably getting a bit of a, a theme there. It's, it's putting tools into our hands so that we can grab a hold of them. And uh, again, we're, we're so privileged to have Paul with us this morning. Can you put your hands together as Paul comes and, and, and shares with us? Good morning. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, so excited. It's a real privilege. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Um, so we uh, live in Texas, which is why I sound so Texan. And um, I realized um, when I first went to Texas, I was going to have issues because I went into a restaurant and I ordered uh, my meal and my waitress asked me for my order a second time and a third time and the fourth time she asked me in Spanish. (laughs) So um, I realized Americans don't speak English uh, within a week of getting there, but hopefully you guys do. I love being with Australians. It's like England with sun. So I love being here. Um, So thank you so much for inviting me. I really, really appreciate it. Um, Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, discipleship. I'm going to share a little bit of my story. And if you come to the masterclass this afternoon, it gets really, really practical. If you're a parent, uh, I think you're going to find it very, very helpful, especially. Um, But it all really starts um, when I was uh, 14 years old and I had uh, eczema. I had to lie in a bath and when my bandages came off, my skin used to peel off. And there was a teacher at my school who advertised a tent crusade and I went there and I heard the gospel for the first time, became a Christian, went home, prayed for the first time and God healed me, which was amazing. So I had this absolute conviction that God is real. I wanted to tell people about it. Um, So I thought I was going to be a missionary. Um, At the age of about 21, 22, I went to uh, Scotland to train to be a missionary. And when I was there, um, God clearly told me to go back to Manchester. So when I got back to Manchester, there was a a white witch who um, was operating in North Manchester who had an occult shop. And to promote her occult shop, she um, accused pastors of ridiculing anybody who was into Wicca or magic, which they didn't really do. But she effectively shut down the schools to any kind of Christian input for quite a long time. So I got invited in by some students to go into school and I began to help them with their lunchtime club. And I started to notice that in this school, there were like a thousand young people in the school 
and maybe 20 in our church. And somebody else was paying for the building. Somebody else was paying the staff. Somebody else was paying the electric bills. I thought, if I can just get to this school, if I can go in and share my faith, that'd be amazing. So I went to the education committee in Manchester, knocked on the door, asked them uh, for six subjects that I could teach on. And I went to the school and said, hey, when you do law and order, um, you bring in the police. And when you do health and safety, you bring in the firemen in. Maybe when you do these six subjects, you can bring me in. And the teacher said, yes. And my first introduction, I can remember at least, in a lesson was, well, class, we've been looking at the myths that people believe in around the world. And last week, we looked at Noah and the Ark. You're not going to believe this, but we found someone who believed it really happened. His name's Paul. Let's give him a round of applause. And that was my introduction. And uh, within about 10 minutes, young people were asking me questions about why I believed. I was able to share my faith. And within about a year or two, I was in 17 different schools. Uh, and what happened was it was great because I was reaching about 10,000 students. I'll mention that in a moment. But young people wanted to go to church and they wouldn't go to church unless there was someone there they knew. So I prayed about it. And 30 years ago, I had a good idea. And the idea was what if I recruited some other people like me who didn't know what they were doing I could help train them and we'd all be based in a different church. And we'd act as a relational bridge between the church and the school. So the first pace team, if I could put this on, this was the first pace team. And there's me, it's a little bit blurry, isn't it? But I'm in the middle, because it's a long time ago, and I'm crossing my arms and I'm feeling full of myself. Because in my mind, I actually hadn't thought, let's start a movement. I thought, let's start one team. And in my, me, my mind, that was it. This was the vision. We, we, would, we were fulfilled the vision and I was super happy. Um, 25 years later, and uh, we started to recruit more people. So we offer a mission year. Um, there's free accommodation, free meals, free training. We recruit young people from around the world, put them in teams, and base them at churches like this. And so now um, we started in England. Don't know if you can see this, but these are the places we are around the world Ireland, Germany, Canada, USA, Brazil, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, Pakistan, India, Philippines, Australia and New Zealand, and currently right now we're training uh, new leaders for these different nations as well uh, right now. So we're excited because God is on the move, and he's especially moving in schools, which is absolutely wonderful. So sometimes I tell stories, these are the young people who graduated from Pays, I think it was last year or the year before in England, and uh, these are young people in Africa, and they're, they're training in Havarim, so we're training young people to share the word of God with other young people. Um, this is in Brazil where this young lady, um, she was um, um, met by the Pays team. She gave her life to Jesus. Our gospel is not Jesus came to rescue you. That's not our gospel message. Our gospel message is Jesus didn't simply come to rescue you. He came to recruit you. And so that's the message. So when we, when we reach young people, we're not saying to them, hey, Jesus came to rescue you from from uh, you know, hell, we're saying, hey, Jesus came to recruit you to bring heaven to earth. And so this young lady, she got saved and now she's on pays, or she was on pays, this photo is a little bit older, reaching some young people in her nation. This is in Pakistan, it's actually in, in uh, Islamabad. Uh, we had a phone call from a school in Islamabad, think about the word Islamabad, <laughs> complaining to us. And they complained because we were not in their school, but we were in the school down the road. And I say this all the time, but the reason we miss God in our lives is not because we don't know what he looks like, it's because we've decided in advance what he looks like. So we think, well, we know what revival looks like. Revival looks like people coming to our church and fill up our meetings. We have to build bigger churches and we have to have more meetings. But what actually, while we're looking for this, what if God's over here moving in the schools of the world? And we're ignoring it, you guys aren't, but we're ignoring it generally as the church because we know what God looks like, but actually God's doing this. So right now, God's doing amazing things uh, all around the world. This is in Germany. In Germany, if you're on pays like Joel, who was up here before, um, Germans get given money for coming on pays. So if you skint, see Joel. <laughs> uh, this is my favorite story I like to tell. This is uh, Clem and Nani. So Clem, on the right, he's from India, Chennai. Went to England to train with pays. Went back to his church in Chennai, India. Said to his pastor, hey, would it be okay if I tried these things with our youth? And the pastor said to him, no, that's just an American slash English thing. It won't work in India. But Clem begged him. And so the, the pastor's credit, he said, I'll give you six months. It went so well, he literally gave him a wife. 
and her name is Anani. And they had an arranged we wedding, an arranged marriage, and now they lead pays together. So if you've got a son who's in the house far too much, send him on pays. If he does a good job, we'll find him a wife. The pays movement or the pairs movement, take your pick. So one of the questions I ask is, why did God make me below average? I know it sounds a weird question, but why did God make me below average? I was born below average in every way. I was born below average academically, below average athletically, uh, certainly below average artistically. I was infamously, I'm not making this up by the way, people ask me afterwards, you make it? No. I was infamously ugly in my family. So um, I was a very, very ugly baby. I know all babies are cute apart from me. Most babies look like Winston Churchill. I look like an ugly Winston Churchill. So this true story. Uh, when my grandmother came to see me for the first time, she walked into the hospital ward, and in the 60s in England, all the mothers would be there in the bed, and the husbands would be sat proudly next to them, and the baby would be in the cots. So there'd be rows of beds. She walked in. Now, obviously, I can't remember this. But my dad tells me she walked in. She went, hi, hi, where is he? Oh, oh. <laughs> She looked at me, and she looked up, and then she looked at me, and then apparently what she did was she picked me up, and she took me to the window to check that what she was seeing was really true. That's true. So she looks, and then without saying another word, she puts me in the cot. She looks up. Oh, this one's nice. That's what she said to my mum about that's how ugly I was, all right? I was super ugly. And I was born with a slight speech impediment. You just think I'm English. But I'm, I'm, I've got a slight speech, so I mix up my words sometimes. Sometimes I don't finish a sentence. And it's partly to do with my brain. I can't, certain things I can't memorize properly or say properly. Um, so, um, for instance, when I did a, an assembly at a school once, um, the uh, principal thought it went well. And he asked me if I would say the Lord's Prayer at the end. Now, you've got to realize, if I taught on the Lord's Prayer, even if you've been a Christian a long time, I think I probably could teach you things you don't know about the Lord's Prayer, about how it's taken from the Amida and all sorts of stuff. But if you ask me to recite the Lord's Prayer, even now, you've got a 50-50 chance of it happening because I just mix things up. So um, this headmaster said to me, Paul, that was great. Would you mind leading us through the Lord's Prayer? Which is odd in a school, but he, sure. So I'm thinking, Maybe. <laughs> So what I did was I thought, okay, well, here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll say it a bit slower than the kids, because they obviously know it. So I'll start off our father, and then when they say it, I'll know the next bit. So our father, who, who art in heaven. But as I slowed down, they started to slow down. <laughs> Which really got awkward. So I thought, all right then, I'll say it quieter, because he can't hear me. I'm sorted. So I, said, I started to go in quieter, but as I said it quieter, yeah, they said it quieter. And it, I got slower and quieter towards the end. And at the end, I looked at them, they looked at me, and all of us were asking, what just happened? <laughs> it took forever to get through his prayer. And I'm, I'm feeling really awkward. They're like, just looking at me like, where are you from? And then this happened. The principal came from the back like this. <laughs> and he had tears in his eyes. Paul, that was amazing. The way you made us think about every single word. It's the way I roll. So I learned a couple of things. First thing I learned was God uses your weaknesses for his strengths, yeah? But here's what I've really learned. Because why would God give, give this task to me? and I'd be born below average. Why not give it to someone who's really, really clever, who's someone who's super charismatic, someone who's naturally articulate, someone who's, you know, all these cool things that I could be. Why would he give that to me? I think I've got the most important job in the world. There is nobody on the planet, including the president or prime minister, in my opinion, who has a more important job than me. I have a message, like you, there's a difference between eternal life and death. I reach through the teams hundreds of thousands of young people in buildings that somebody else paid for. Nobody on the planet has a more important job than me. So why give it a numpty like me to do? And I believe it's this. God made me below average to help average people do above average things. 
God made me below average to help average people do above average things. See, I've got some really cool mates who are super charismatic and really naturally gifted. But they're getting to my age now, late 20s, and they're big... Well, that was rude. And, and beginning to think to themselves, how do I pass this on? I've got friends who are super funny, just naturally really funny, brilliant communicators. But how do they pass that on to someone when it's a natural gift? Anything I can do, anybody can do. So God made me below average, I truly believe this, to have average people do above average things. And here's the key part of what I want to talk about today is what is our capacity to advance the kingdom of God? What does it look like? If you've got your Bibles, please open them at Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, starting at verse 16. Matthew 28, starting at verse 16. Because Jesus gives us the key here. From uh, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always till the very end of the age. Go and make disciples. Here's the problem. So when I was younger, I don't know if you can see that from the back, forgive me, but this bottom line says individual skills, zero to 10. When I was younger, I was obsessed with things like my ministry gift. What's my ministry gift? And how good am I at, at doing certain things? And I wanted to get myself closer to God. And I wanted to get myself to know the Bible better. I wanted to be able to answer questions better and understand things better. And during that time, I did schools work. Let's say I was a seven between zero and 10. I was pretty good at schools work. In that time, I was able to reach 10,000 students on average per year. But I integrated into church. I made disciples of less than 10 per year. And then something switched. I had a bit of a revelation. It wasn't about my ministry gift. It was about my gift to disciple people. Could I disciple people? And so in 1992, I started to disciple people. Let's say I'm reasonably good at discipleship. Let's call me a seven out of 10. Well, now we've reached millions and we've integrated thousands. In that time, I didn't get more time. I got married to the Foxy Lynn. We had two sons. We've got a granddaughter and another, another granddaughter on the way, which I found out this week, which is cool. So in that time, I didn't get more time. I just got a lot smarter. And I started to do what Jesus actually said me, told me to do. Here's what we need to understand. Our ministry gifts are just nuance. That's all they are. You and I were called to go and make disciples. I don't care if you have a hospitality gift, I don't care if you have a gift of encouragement. I don't care if you have a gift of um, prophecy. I don't know if you believe in prophecy. I'm Pentecostal, boo, so forgive me. Um, I don't care. It's just nuance. It's the way you do what you're supposed to do. What you're supposed to do, what we're supposed to do, is go and make disciples. And we can advance the kingdom of God far more effectively when we multiply what we do. When I first went to... Now, I'm very visual. It's partly because I'm not very good at speaking, so forgive me. So when I went to America... Uh, there was a church there that asked me to come and help them do what we do. And uh, they had this phrase, we, we get our A-star people, we get A-star people onto our team. That was their phrase. The idea being that if you need a five, so I'm talking about like skill level, you know, zero to 10. If we need a five, we need to hire and recruit a five. We need to find someone from somewhere else, pay some money and get them to come to our church. And over time, with a little bit of experience, they might become a six. I just don't think that's the biblical method, the biblical model. It seems to me, this is, I might recruit someone, I might see someone get saved and begin to disciple them. They might be a five, but I may be a little bit further ahead than them. So let's say I'm a seven. Let's say I'm good at multiplying what's in them, growing what's in them, helping them become all that God has called them to be and do. And together, we're 12. Does that make sense? I got my math right. So my question this morning is, what's your discipleship number? What's your discipleship number? What's the added value you bring to the kingdom of God by discipling other people? 
How many people are you discipling? And what are you actually doing in that discipleship? Or have you, as I did, got totally distracted by your ministry gift and by your personal walk with Jesus? Now, it was never said this morning. I love the fact it's never said when I go to church, but I hate it when it is said, when a worship leader gets up and says things like, hey, let's just block everybody out and just, just concentrate between me and you and Jesus. That's the last thing you should be doing at church. Do that at home. We come to church to encourage and challenge and teach and mobilize each other. The last thing you should be doing at church is shutting out everybody else. One of the reasons I worship God with my hands is partly because I want to say to God, I'm surrendered to you, but partly to encourage other people as well. So what's your discipleship number? What does it look like? Where, where are you going with all this thing? I also want to talk just briefly for three ways of increasing it. So this afternoon, we're going to talk about some really practical ways of how to disciple people. But today, I just want to talk about three simple principles, three mistakes I've made over the years and things that I've learned. And the first one is this. We need to move beyond education to experience. It says this in that passage. Then Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. As he said that, I bet they thought to themselves, dead right, we've seen it. Dead right, we've seen what happens to the winds and the waves. We've seen what happens to the blind. We've seen what happens to the deaf. They had experienced it. They'd experienced it. And one of the problems we've got in church right now, I mean the church right now, is that we've taken discipleship and we made it all about education and what we do particularly in the states right now is we educate people and then when it doesn't work we we go and hire a better educator a better speaker and then what happens is we call small groups discipleship groups I don't know why because discipleship class is an oxymoron in my mind it's a bit like Microsoft works so what happens is what happened? So if I speak on this stage to, I don't know how, how many people are here, but let's say no, several hundred people or a few hundred people, I don't know what the number is. I'm speaking to you guys. If I suddenly get off the stage and start chatting to these three guys and we just sit down around the table and I say the same thing to them and they ask me questions, it doesn't suddenly become discipleship. It's just education. It's just a smaller group. So what makes discipleship is the experience. What we do is we educate people and hope they have an experience. Why do we do that? When Jesus took people on an experience and educated them along the way. So, so why have we changed that? I don't understand why we've changed that. Maybe it's just because it's easier. Maybe we're not having an experience ourselves. My question is, what's your experience? What's your experience of the kingdom of God? And who can you invite into that journey? And who can you train in whatever it is you do when you're advancing the kingdom of God. That's where your ministry gift does become important because maybe you have a gift of hospitality. Well, who can you train in that gift and where can you go outside of church to advance the kingdom of God with that gift of hospitality or that gift of encouragement or that speaking gift or wherever it might be that you have? One of the questions I love to ask is when did the disciples first become Christians? When did that happen? I get all sorts of answers. Normally there's six main answers. Usually the first person says when they started to follow Jesus. To which I ask them, did they believe who Jesus was at that point? In the same way that we would expect them to believe if we were gonna baptize them. Most of the times people say no. Then some people will say, well, maybe the day of Pentecost or Peter's confession, which is probably a good option or maybe the resurrection. But usually, when people think about it, they always say at some point along the journey. Then I ask the question, when did disciples first start to get discipled by Jesus? So when did Jesus first start to disciple the disciples? And they will say, correctly, the minute they followed him. And I reply, so what you're telling me is that Jesus discipled people and at some point, they became Christians. They followed him. They believed in him. People go, yeah. So my question is, why don't we do that? 
Discipleship is the best form of evangelism. We'll, we'll probably talk about that this afternoon if you come along. Discipleship is, a, I, I disciple people in my community, my neighborhood, who are not Christians yet, but they've started to come to church. Because discipleship is the best form of evangelism. And one of the problems is that we've not understood this understanding about experience. So it's a bit like, um, I was in Manchester a while back, and in Manchester they have these um, travel agent shops. Nowadays most people book their holidays on the internet, but you used to be able to go into a shop, and I'd always pump like some kind of coconut smell in the shop. It was always nice. You walk in, I'm in Manchester, I'm in Hawaii. It was amazing. You'd walk in, and then there'd be someone there, and they'd have like a little magazine, and they'd say, um, hey, here's, you should go to Paris. Look, look how beautiful Paris is. I've heard Paris is an amazing thing. If you go to Paris, we can help you get to Paris. And here's some of the things that you could do if you go to Paris. That's what a travel agent does. A tour guy says, I'm going to Paris. Do you want to come with me? And we've turned discipleship from being a tour guide into a travel agent. You should read your Bible. It's really good. And here's some of the things you should go and do. And if you do this, this will probably happen. You should read your Bible. Well, Jesus said, come with me. I'm going to show you what this looks like. And along the way, you're going to ask me a ton of questions, and I'm going to educate you. So it's not experience versus education. It's putting the horse back before the cat. Jesus preached, so he educated in, in large groups. But when he discipled people, he took them on an experience. What's the experience you're taking someone on? If you've got kids, are you just educating them? Or are you taking them on an experience? Have you took them on mission yet? Have you done that yet? What, what have you done with your young people where they see you advance the kingdom of God with your ministry gift and they begin to learn the principles of how they can do that with their ministry gift? Because the principles are always the same. Your ministry gift might be hospitality or preaching or encouragement. Makes no difference. Or music. But the principles of advance of the kingdom are just the same. The second thing I learned along the way is we need to go beyond protecting to proving. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the US right now, 83% of young people going to church will not be going to church after their first year of college. So 83% of young people who go to church regularly will not go to church regularly after their first year of college. Why is that? There's probably all sorts of reasons, but this is why I felt God say to me. I was reading the story of David and Goliath, and there's David, and he's about to fake, face Goliath, and he's scared, he's terrified, but he's brave and he's courageous. Everybody else is terrified, but he, he thinks I'm going to do it. So what happens is the king puts his armor on David, and in our Sunday school version, David's little, the armor's too big, and David can't move because the armor's too big. That's not what happened. There's a lot in this story, but one basic thing is that he says, the original language basically says to the king, I can't use this because I've not proven it yet. I don't know if this works. So he discards that armor, and he goes to something he has proven because he's killed the wild animals with the, the, you know, the sling. He picks up, and he goes and kills his Goliath. In America right now, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but in America right now, what's happening is we're protecting our kids so much that when they go to college and they face these theories and philosophies and personalities who are like giants for the enemy, and all they've got is their pastor's faith, their pastor's education, or their parents' faith or education, they may discard that, but they've not had a chance to prove anything else. They've not proven they don't know for a fact that God protects them. They don't know for a fact that God can heal. They don't know for a fact that God can provide. Why? Because they've been told about it, but they've not experienced it because people haven't taken them on an experience. Jesus took his disciples from strange places. Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. There's lots of different ways you can translate that. But Caesarea Philippi was built on a rock. At the bottom was a spring where water came out, it was called the gates of hell because they believed the spirits would come out of it. It was where the pan god, uh, uh, the goat god, was worshipped. 
23 kilometers away from where Jesus mainly was. He takes his young disciples, teenagers, on a field trip. Most of them were teenagers. One very respected historian thinks that the youngest disciple was eight years old. I personally doubt that, but they certainly were young. He takes these young teenage boys, plus Peter, who's a bit older, definitely, and he takes them to this place, and he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. In other words, I would uh, interpret that as, with these kind of people, I'm going to build my church. He takes them somewhere. He takes them on a field trip. Where are we taking people? Are we protecting them too much? We either empower youth or we embrace death. Where we either, as a church, we either empower youth, which you guys are doing, or we embrace death. So when we're reaching young people, we're offering them a journey. We're offering them a chance to make a difference. Our gospel is not Jesus simply came to rescue you. It's that Jesus came to recruit you and you're unique. You know, we say to young people, I say to people all the time, why, did, why do you exist? Why do you exist? It's really simple. You exist because God did not have anybody exactly like you. And he wanted someone exactly like you. There's something about you that is unique. But it wasn't just for you. There's something about you unique that can advance the kingdom of God. And God came to recruit you. Jesus came to recruit you for that purpose. Yeah, he rescued you along the way. He died on the cross to redeem us. But there's a bigger picture. I'm just going to show you a short video. It's what we, we show young people when we're recruiting them. Uh, to what we call the Pays Youth Academy. I don't know if we can play that video. That'd be amazing. So our goal right now uh, globally is to raise up 10,000 teenagers as local missionaries. We want to train them in leadership. We want to train them in evangelism. We want to train them in discipleship. We want to train them in Bible study. We want to give them, forgive me for saying this, we want to give them a different kind of Christianity. We don't want to give them what I call a Christian-centric Christianity. From the start, we want to give them a kingdom-centric Christianity. A Christian-centric Christianity says, I'm going to pursue what the world pursues. I'm just going to do God's version of it. So I want wealth and health and happiness. I want a great life. But I'm going to make sure I do it God's way. That's fine. That's okay. It's not what Jesus wants. Jesus said, don't be like the pagans, because that's what the pagans did. The pagans would go to their God and say, I've got this plan, is that okay with you? They would go to their priests and say, I'm thinking of doing this. What, what do I need to avoid so I don't get into trouble? And what do I need to do so the gods bless me? Jesus said, don't be like the pagans. Instead, seek first my kingdom. And as you seek first my kingdom, I'll give you everything else you need. But when you wake up in the morning, make my kingdom your primary concern. The problem with that is most Christians I know, when I ask them, what is the kingdom of God, they can't tell me. Now, if I ask them, what is the church, they can tell me, oh, it's not the, it's not the building, it's the people of God. Absolutely. What's the kingdom of God? Um, is, it, is that where you go when you die? Um, how can you seek first the kingdom of God if you don't know what the kingdom of God is? But Jesus says, if, you, if your primary concern is bringing heaven to your workplace, Heaven to your neighborhood, heaven to your community, heaven to your school. If you make that your primary concern, if that's the thing that drives you, he says, I'll take care of the rest. So we want to raise up a generation of that kind of Christianity. And to do that, our gospel needs to be a little bit different. It's not Jesus came to simply rescue, it's came, Jesus came to recruit you. And we want to train them by example a different way. Because what I've learned is this, you can reverse the trend. Right now, Pat and Sarah tell me 50,000 young people leave the church in Australia every year. 
And it's probably something similar in America, in England, all these places. And I think it's partly because we've offered them an education, Christian-centric Christianity. I'm not saying this is the whole answer, but I think we need to get back, as Carl said before, we need to get back to doing what Jesus told us to do. Go and make disciples. As parents, we need to learn, and we need to learn, me and Lynn need to learn how to do a better job of that. Finally, we need to go beyond answers to understanding. It says, when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. That was fine. Our doubts often lead us to better understanding. Um, It's been said that Jesus was asked 300 questions in his ministry and gave a straight answer to three. It's been said by some scholars that Jesus asked around about 125 questions. Most of them will reply to being asked one. So statistically, if you met Jesus in Galilee and asked him a question, you had a one in a hundred chance of getting a straight answer. Why? Because we believe in Q and A. Rabbis believed in Q and Q. So you would ask a question, you'd get a question asked back. Why is that? I've got a theory. So I think it's a bit like this. I'm very simple. It's all visuals with me. Forgive me. I'm not that bright. This makes sense to me. Sometimes we have a question of God. Here's our question. And we want to get to the answer as fast as we possibly can. So our question might be, how often do I need to forgive someone? We want to get to the answer. Just give me a number, God. Give me a number. And what God sees when we ask some of our questions is actually there's something more important than the answer that we don't understand yet. There's something we don't understand yet. A principle of the kingdom we've not understood. When you ask God a question, how often do I need to forgive this person? God sees you've not understood grace yet. And so God asks us questions, and through questions, he helps us understand. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. When we understand, the answer comes really quickly. We figure it out ourselves. So there's a great story of a a young lady who was in Jerusalem on a holiday, looking around the Holy Land, and she wanted a memento. So she went into a shop that sold photographs, and she said, I'll take one of these back um, as a memento for my trip. She couldn't decide which one because they were all amazing. So she went to the the Jewish guy who took the photos and said, excuse me, I don't know which one to choose. Can you tell me which one's your favorite? To which he says, are you married? So she's like, am I married? And then she remembers, oh, I need to keep asking questions for the conversations to keep keep going. She says, yeah, I am married. Why do you ask? To which he, he asks, okay. Do you have children? Well, yeah, I have, I have three children. Why do you ask? Great. Which one's your favorite? <laughs> now, he could have simply said, when she asked the question, hey, which one's your favorite? He could have said, oh, they're like children to me. And she would have learned something in her head. What he did was he made her feel something. He made her feel what he felt. And when we... When we reach people, I think we have this pressure to feel like we need to know all the best answers. In reality, we just need to be the people with the best questions. We need to ask the questions that Jesus asked. And this afternoon, we'll talk about how to do that a little bit later on. But the aim of rabbinic teaching was not simply to give answers. It was to give understanding. Vision is sim- similar, you know. Sometimes we ask, her, well, what should I do and where should I go? We're looking for a name of a place or a thing we should do. And what God sees is you don't understand the purpose of vision yet. The purpose of vision is is unclear to you. You think it's a place or a thing you do. The journey of vision, like Abram discovered when God changed his name from Abram to Abraham by adding an initial from God's name, was the whole point of vision is that my dream will become your dream. That's the purpose. The way I feel about things, you will feel about things. And that doesn't translate in an education class. That translates through experience, through people seeing your passion, through people seeing how you respond in a crisis, through people experiencing what you experience. So this afternoon, uh, we're going to look at this idea of how do we disciple anyone 
in anything. Let me go back a bit. Uh, we're going to decide how to disciple anyone in anything. And for me, it's really, really important. 25 years ago, when we had about three or four teams on pays, um, this guy came to my church and said, Paul, I believe God's going to give you everywhere you step. So I thought, okay, I'll walk across England. How about that? <laughs> so I walked across England and prayed for the schools of England. That was 25 years ago. And in May this year, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to walk across England as an old man. I'm going to walk across England. Hopefully, I'll make it this time. And this time, I'm going to pray for the schools of the world. But what I'm really going to be praying for secretly is the churches of the world. Because we're missing a massive opportunity. We're missing a job. Well, you're not, praise God. But most churches are missing a huge opportunity. God is moving in schools. God is raising up a new generation of Christians that are not going to be obsessed with how do I get a better life God's way, but how do I bring God's plan, God's dream to this planet, knowing that God will take care of the rest. That's what we're about. And I'm excited about that. And maybe you could pray for us as we do. We're going to, all our teams around the world are going to be praying. In fact, when I shared this with my leaders, they said, oh, we'll do it. We'll, we'll walk around our communities. And we think we're aiming again to match the Youth Academy number. We're aiming to get 10,000 people who will walk around their schools in an appropriate way and pray for their schools throughout the world. We've got people everywhere all around the world doing this in May. Maybe you could join us. Maybe you could go with your PACE team and, and walk around some of the schools and pray for some of the schools in the area. It's super important. So we're doing this thing called the through hike for school and that's the challenge and maybe you would get involved in that. Let me just finish with this story. Um, many, many years ago, a friend of mine was um, going to a school and uh, he had a friend with it who had a guitar. So they went into the school to do an assembly and my friend, uh, my friend's friend started to play a, a worship song and suddenly there was a scream from the back and uh, a boy, turned out he was nine years old, was rushed onto by all the teachers. They picked him up and they took him out of the class. And uh, the principal said to my friend, uh, carry on, but I need to talk to you after the assembly. So my mate's, oh, what have I done? So he does the assembly. And afterwards, the, the principal takes him back to his office and says, I'm sorry about the kerfuffle, very English word. I'm sorry about the kerfuffle. He said, I just need to explain. This was a Tuesday. He said, um, that boy on Friday at nine years old, was taken by his father to a local pub, stood on a table and auctioned for the night for any man who would pay for him. Five pound was what he got. He came in on Monday, a complete and absolute mess, this young boy. And when they started the worship songs, just something happened. We don't know what happened, really. Now, why do I tell that story? It's not just to get you, oh. It's because that's happening throughout our world while we're in church. You drove here from your house. Who knows what was going on in the homes that you passed? Who knows what was happening in the homes that you passed? We've got to get out there. And when we get out there, with whatever gifting we have to make a difference, my gifting is different from yours. Yours is different from your next door neighbor. We've got to take people with us. Because it's not just about us feeling nice because we're making a difference. It's about us truly making an impact. And that only is going to happen through multiplication. So, yes, you can change the world. And it takes more than a good idea to change the world. It takes a methodology. And Jesus chose discipleship. Jesus didn't invent discipleship. He chose discipleship. So today, if you're thinking, you know what, I need to respond to this, then you don't need to come to the front and just say a prayer and a wave over you or anything, I would encourage you to find out how do I disciple people? How do I recruit somebody? How do I, how do I even ask someone if they want to be discipled by me? And then what do I do with them? Most of us don't know how to do that. We'll talk about that this afternoon. But for now, I'd just like to pray for us and pray that God will help us just pivot in our understanding. So maybe you could close your eyes and maybe we can pray together. So just this morning, just as we're thinking, I'm sure that God has put you on a, a journey and I'm sure that you know that you have gifts and abilities that you can use for his kingdom. But maybe right now you don't know who you can take on that journey with you. But maybe this morning you would, you would 
say to God, Lord, I'm willing, I'm willing to open up my life and I'm willing to take others on the journey with me. Maybe you've not done that before. Maybe you're a brand new Christian. You can still do this. Maybe you'd say this morning, Lord, I'm willing to take others on the journey with me. Maybe you're not sure how to do that, but you're saying, Lord, Lord, give me the wisdom to do that. Give me the wisdom to take others on the journey with me. And I'd like to pray for you. I'm not actually to do anything. I'd just like to pray for you. But I want to give you just a few moments of silence just to respond to God or whatever he's saying to you right now. And then I'd like to pray. Lord, I thank you for every unique person in this place this morning. I thank you, Lord, that we have this incredible knowledge of you and of salvation. And I pray right now for each and every one of us that we would all become not simply disciples, but disciples of others. I pray for those who, who don't know how to disciple, they would they would open their heart and open their mind and you would fill it with wisdom. I pray for those who have not thought about discipling others before but feel challenged this morning. Lord, you would drop people on their heart and mind that they could invite on their journey. Lord, we thank you. You came and you showed us how to do this. You didn't simply tell us what to do. Help us to learn from that lesson, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it, Lord. Amen. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you.